The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. So many near-death experiencers, including myself, hesitated for years to tell the story of what we experienced. With that in mind, it's truly refreshing to welcome a guest to the show who started talking as soon as her eyes opened and has been talking about it nonstop ever since. Charlotte Holmes, who calls herself from time to time the mouth of the South, is the daughter of a preacher, but she herself can evangelize circles around most preachers preaching today. That's because she's been there, done that in a way that impassions her and those who hear her story as well. When a blood pressure of 234 over 134 stopped her heart in the hospital, her OBE quickly brought her to magnificent views of heaven and ultimately to directions from God to bring as many as possible back with her. For the time, the time is now very short. And here to tell you the story in full is Charlotte Holmes herself. Charlotte, welcome to NDE Radio. Well, thank you. I'm so happy to be here and excited, excited to share. Well, I'm excited, too. I, I think uh, I've seen some other interviews that you've done, and um, it's, it's, uh, you're inspirational, and, uh, and you are bringing back a message that is, I think is very important. Charlotte, you've said that uh, nine years before your amazing NDE, you'd had a stroke and a left side paralysis. Um, did your faith help you get through that setback in your life? It did. Uh, you know, I, I have fully believed that I think our lives are ordained from birth, what God has in store. Of course, we have that choice because we're free will. But I I uh, had my stroke, and I was, um, I used to play, or I did play piano at church. And all I could think about when I had the stroke is I didn't want my grandkids to have to push me around. I didn't want my husband to have to totally take care of me. Mm-hmm. But my faith in God, and he's always been there, I mean, we wander away from him, but he never wanders away from us. He's always right there. So that faith helped me to be uh, uh, probably stubborn enough to try to make it back. I threw a lot of physical therapy, a lot of playing the piano, and a lot of prayer and help with my family and my friends. Um, I, I did make it back from that. I still have some problems because of the stroke, but nothing that keeps me from doing my everyday life. But that sort of setback can be a, a real... Um instrument in a person's life to focusing them their attention more on God than perhaps before it was. Um, y- your blood pressure was an unsustainable 234 over 134, and you'd been in the hospital for three days when you collapsed, and your husband Dan was with you, and he described later, I guess, what, what happened. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, I, like you said, I had been in the, there three days, and they come in to give me a little sponge bath. Uh, Danny was has always been by my side. We'll be married 50 years come October. Um, and God definitely knew what he was doing when he gave me Danny, because I'm probably the most uh, stubborn. Um, and, and I always want to get things done fast. That's my problem. <laughs> but we were in the hospital, and he said, when they come in to give me the, the sponge bath, he said, all of a sudden, your eyes were wide open, but you fell over in bed. And so the little girl that was doing it said, I don't think she's breathing. Mm. And immediately Danny said that they called a code and they all come running through. It seemed like just at the moment I come above my body and I could look down and see everything they were doing. I seen Danny standing in the corner. I seen the nurses over me. I seen one on top of my giving me, on top of me, giving chest compressions. I've seen everything. But then, like, in a blink of an eye, and when God says he's going to call us home in a blink of an eye, that's exactly what happens. Blink of an eye, I smelt the most beautiful flowers I've ever smelt in my whole life. Um, I love flowers, but there is nothing on this earth that compares to that smell. Um, again, I remember opening my eyes when I heard music and I could I knew I knew from that point where I was I knew I was in heaven because the beauty is just uh, beyond anything that I can even there's no words on this earth to tell you how beautiful heaven is 
You're a musician. Describe the music that you heard. Mm. Well, I was always raised Southern gospel. Mm-hmm. I love praise and worship. And it's a combination of everything. It's not like anything you've heard. It's not just Southern gospel. It's not just praise and worship. It is, mm, it's the angels singing. But yet we can all join in on it. I laughingly say, I'm not a very good singer, but boy, when I, I know I can sing in heaven. Wow. It's just, it's the music, the music of angels. I have no other way to describe it. Does it have words to it? I did not hear words. I did not, but I, I knew the words were there, but I did not hear the words. It's just, um, I, I don't know. I, that's, a, that's something I cannot answer because I knew there was words, but I can't tell you what those words were. I think you have to be there. I think you have to be present and totally there to be able to say the words. And I think you said that uh, the the lakes and the trees and the flowers and the grasses were all swaying with the music. They were. As I looked around, like I said, the, the colors are vibrant. I mean, they're not, when you look, the colors are so bright and so beautiful. Um, but and as I looked, I could see the flowers and the trees and everything just swaying with that music because everything in heaven praises God. And then as I began to look around, I seen the biggest angels. It was like they were on all four corners. You know, and in heaven, you can see so much. There's so much. It's eternity. So God showed me so much in a glance. I could see the rivers. I could see the oceans. I could see the valleys. I could see everything, like in a glance. And the peace and the contentment, the, the joy is just unsurpassed. But as I looked at these seven angels, I, I could see that they were just humongous, and they would take one wing, and they would fan that wing out. And then they would take the next wing, and they would fan it out. And I could feel the rush of that wind off their angel wings. And yet, it probably, it was... Peace. Did you feel like you were still in your body? when you had that kind of a feeling? I felt like the presence of God was so strong that I could feel that I was in in his presence. I knew I was in his presence. To be out of my body, I had none of that. So it was like being resurrected. It was like being holy. It was like being pure. It was, it was just pure joy and contentment. I was just trying to think if that wind might be a, a, like a spiritual vibration more than a, the, the kind of breeze that we... When he's ready, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't make that too soon. You've got a lot to do here yet. <laughs> so you had this beautiful, amazing vista of, of mountains and trees and, and woods and gardens and flowers. And then uh, apparently you saw um, the Golden Gate. Oh, I did. Uh, was that right right in the garden, or was it somewhere else? No, it was right. It was like I was looking out, and then I, I turned to my right, and I, I seen this, this gate. I mean, we're talking golden gates. We're talking jasper. We're talking jewels. Uh, and, yes, the, the streets of heaven are pure gold. I mean, the beauty, but they're like clear gold. It's like so pure. Everything was so pure. But as I looked at the gate... I stood there, and I could see behind the gate that there stood people waiting. I could see people waving, and I, as I looked, I could see my mom and my dad and my sister. Um, I could see my cousin, who was like a brother to me. He'd had a leg cut off, and there he stood with both legs. I could see my one of my best friends, her and her son had died. They were there. Nobody was wearing glasses. They didn't look like they looked when they left Earth. They looked like they were in the prime of their life, like in their 30s. No glasses, just well and happy, and they were waving. So they seen me as I seen them. I seen saints of old. I seen John the Baptist. I, and I knew immediately who these people were. Because, you know, it says in the Bible, we will, we will be known as we are known. And I knew who they were. I Even though I had never seen some of these, in person, like the saints, I knew they were there. Preachers were there. So this was a multitude that turned out for you. It wasn't just your family. Yes, a multitude. 
you know, I, I laughingly told my husband later, I said, you know, I don't know how they knew I was coming home. I, I said, I don't know if God says, okay, Charlotte's coming home today. Everybody that wants to greet her, come down. I don't know. I just like to think that it is so comforting to me. And as I talk to people that have lost loved ones, it's comforting to say they were all there. The family, the friends, people that they loved are there waiting on them. They're waiting to welcome you home because they're so excited that you've come home. But as I looked, Again, I, as I looked, and I looked at my mother and dad's feet, and there was this toddler, and I, there was no audible word spoken, but I could hear my Lord say, because uh, I said, who, who is that? Because I knew everybody else, but I said, who is that? And he says, that's your child, Charlotte. You see, Danny and I had lost a little boy. We'd had a daughter, and she was almost two years old. And I was five and a half months pregnant. Excuse me if I cry because it gets me. I was five and a half months pregnant when I lost it. Back then, they didn't, uh, of course, we didn't know what it was. They didn't have a way of telling you then. And at that time, they didn't let you hold that baby. They didn't let you say goodbye to it. We didn't get to bury him. We didn't get nothing. But as I looked at this child, he said, that's your son. And when I had him, they held him up. I can remember them holding him up, and they said, Charlotte, it's a boy. And then he was just gone. Well, I went through such a deep, dark depression. People, they're, depression's real. People, I've heard people tell me, oh, depression's not real. That's, you, you've got to get your head wrapped around things. No, that's wrong. There is a depression. And the only way out of a, a depression, I feel, is through the Holy Spirit, is through God who comforts you and brings you through. But here I had a two-year-old at home, and oh, I was just in a mess. I was in a total mess. I was so depressed. Couldn't hardly take care of her, and, and I was just, it was bad. It, and if my husband hadn't have loved me, he, he would have never put up with me. Finally, one day, Danny came to me, and he said, Mom, he always calls me Mom. He said, Mom, do you not think I didn't lose a child, too? And it was like the one thing that brought me out. I thought, yes, he did. He lost a son, the same as I lost a son. But then as I looked at this child, it was a toddler. It wasn't, it wasn't what they'd held up and showed me. It was a toddler. And I said, but Lord, how can this be? And I heard him say, there is, it's eternity. They continue to grow at a slower rate. I mean, it had been 40-some, 48 years almost. And there, my child was a toddler, and my mom and dad was taking care of my baby. Wow. Now, Charlotte, you had, um, I know in another place you'd said that um, there had a, a, a brilliant light had appeared behind your mom and dad. Now, was this where the uh, information was coming from about who the toddler was? Yes. It was, it was like a heavenly presence at first. But then, right after he explained to me who the child was, I seen a, the light was so bright behind my mom and dad, I couldn't look at it. I, I honestly could not even gaze upon it. I had to turn my head. And when I turned my head, I could look back and I could see my husband and my, my daughter, my grandson, my granddaughter, my son-in-law. I could see them crying. You know, I could see them crying, and they were distraught because I was gone. And I remember turning back, and I said, but, but God, I wanted to make sure that they're okay. I wanted to be sure that my grandkids, who are now 23 and 21, would find somebody and be equally yoked. You know, in the Bible, I used to say when, I used to think when it says you must be equally yoked, that meant the same denomination. That is not true. That is, equally yoked means someone that believes someone that is a faith-based person. You see, I've been blessed to have a husband that would lay hands on me and pray for me when I've been sick, when I went through all the trials that I went through. That's what I wanted for my grandkids. And now my granddaughter is soon to get married in October, and I, I, I'm tickled with the guy that she has chosen because he shall, he will lay hands on her and pray for her. 
that's what I mean. God, it's so important for us to build our faith, build our children's faith. It says, lead them, and that's what we must do. Yes, and this is the reason, actually, you decided, um, or perhaps God decided, that you, you were ready to come back rather than stay in heaven. L- let me ask you, Charlotte, the, the light that you that you saw that was so brilliant, was it God the Father, or was it Jesus, or, or was it a combination of the two? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're all one. You felt it was all... So he, it, it, was, it was him. It was the Almighty. It was the creator of Earth. That's what I thought, because some folks have seen, have met and talked with Jesus, and they see him as a, as a man, looking like a man. God the Father is usually a brilliant light. But the way you um, talked about it, it sounded like both God the Father, God the Son, and, of course, the Holy Spirit as well. The child that miscarried was named Chad. Is that right? That's what we were going to, if it had been a boy, which we didn't know at the time, we were going to name it Chad, S-H-A-D. So that's his name. I I think that's (laughs) It is his name. That's that's (laughs) what he goes by in heaven. He's Chad. Uh, And 48 years later, and he's just a toddler. That's amazing. Oh, I wanted to tell you too, as a chaplain, as a hospital chaplain, hospitals now, when a when a if a woman has a child that's stillborn, uh, they do get to hold it for as long as they want. That this is something that you missed out on. The way when my kids were born, I wasn't even allowed in the delivery room as the father because because that's the way the rules were in those days. These rules are changing. Thank God for that. Oh, I, I, I have a niece that lost a son, and she was able to hold him, and they dressed him, and she loved on him, and she said goodbye to him, which is, I think, so important for a mother and father to be able to do that. So, yeah, when we had it, like you said, that was just the rule. You didn't get to do that. You know. But we were talking about, when I, seen, when I turned back to, to light, and I said, but, Father, I wanted to be sure that they were equally yoked. He said, that's when he said, Charlotte, you have a choice. You can stay or you can go back. But if you go back, you must tell what I have showed you, what I'm about to show you, and what I've told you. You see, I think, God, again, I come back to this. Our lives are ordained, I think from the day that we were born. You see, the day that I was born, my dad had been an alcoholic. He played music in bars. My sister was 13 years older than me. She had remembered going to these bars with my mom and dad and, and you know, laying there while dad was playing music. And, and she remembers those. I never had that experience because the day that I was born, my mother had told my dad, if you're drunk, don't come to the hospital with a child. Will he come? Well, I almost died then. My dad told me the stories many times that he went to the, the, the chaplain there, chaplain there at the hospital, and he prayed, God, if you'll save my child, I will forever, forever live by you. I will always praise you. I will always, I'll do what you want me to do. Well, you see, then my dad become a preacher. So I never knew my dad the drunk. I only knew my dad the preacher. But from that day forward, God knew what was good to me. He knew this was all laid out to him. And he knew, I believe, although I could have made the wrong decision, if he gave me a job to do, I think he knew I was going to do it. He knew I would go forth and do what he wanted. Was I perfect? Oh, my gosh, no. <laughs> you were saving people from the time you were an infant. That's, a, that's incredible. <laughs> See, this is it. And I want people to understand this if they don't understand anything else. I am nobody special. I am nobody. I'm just Charlotte. I like to hunt. I like to fish. I like to camp. I am nobody. But, oh, my Heavenly Father is so good, so loving, so merciful, so joyful. But you see, he gives us the authority to work in his name. And I think so many people that are Christians don't realize the authority authority that we have. So when God says, go forth, and you say, okay, God, I'll go, don't fear, because you see, God goes before you. 
Now, God told you that uh, the time time was short, that he's between the, now and the time he comes back. Of course, that time is different over on the other side. Just witness how Chad's growing up so slowly. But did it, did he give you any other insight into what's going to happen with us? What he said was, when he told me, you know, I've heard my whole life, God's coming soon. God's coming soon. Whether it be, you know, preached from the pulpit or just spoke the word. So I had always thought, oh, yeah, he's coming, but not my, you know, I'm not, I wasn't worried about it. I kind of took it as a, like a grain of salt. He's coming back, and yes, I've got to be ready, but I never took the urgency until he said, soon and very soon I'm coming to get my bride to church. I knew when he said it that it's not long. And then, of course, all you have to do is read Revelation, look at the world, what's going on now. What does that tell you? We're closer and closer. Can I tell you when? No, nobody knows the hour or the day. Nobody but him. But I do know it's soon. I do feel that in my heart. I feel that urgency to bring home as many people as he wanted me to. There's several things that he showed me when I was in heaven that he had never let me tell anybody. Every time I'd go someplace to speak or I'd start to talk about it, he would shut my mouth and he'd say no. So here about a year ago, not maybe not quite a year ago, um, no, it's not been a year ago. It's been probably about five months now. I had to go to Kansas City. I was speaking at uh, my nephew's church. He had lost his father, but he wanted me to speak that night before. And God, on our way to the church, God says, I want you to tell this part. And I'm like, now, Father, now you want me to? See, God's got a really good sense of humor. Some people don't think he does, but oh, he does. He does. And I said, okay. So when I got up to spoke, speak, you see, at the time, God took me to the edge and showed me the edge of hell. Now, not everybody, we've not all been cast there, but he, it was kind of like a vision in inside of what, where I was in heaven. And as I got closer, I could smell the stench of rotten meat. I could smell like burnt hair. I could hear, I could hear screams. I could hear horrible, to the glory I had just seen, to the beauty I had just seen, the complete opposite, the, the mayhem, the awfulness. But as I looked into hell, I could see people that I knew. I could see people that I had that I had uh, admired for so long. I seen preachers have seen on TV that I have admired, and I looked and I said, "But God, this how is this possible?" And He says, "If they do not change, this is where they shall spend eternity." But God, how? And He said, "I show you this to tell you." Do not put your eye on man, put your eye on me. Well, that was a real biggie for me. That was an enlightenment that God showed me. Don't put your eye on man, put your eye only on him. He's the only one that will never lead you astray. He's the only one that will constantly tell you the truth. So there's other things that happen that God still has not released me to tell. Someday he will, maybe, someday he won't. But I have to stay in his spirit. I have to stay with the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit lead me when he tells me. Well, listen, Charlotte, when you're ready to, when God is ready to have you talk about those things, we'll have you come back on the show because we do reach quite an audience through this. As I began to look, I, I could hear I could hear the, the music kind of grow louder. And, and Danny, as he was standing there, he said that, all of a sudden, they come run. They run in, and and they had started this. Had given me a shot, and he said, "Slowly, Mom, I started watching your blood pressure start coming down." He said, "Then I heard your, seen your eye blink." He said, "Before that, he said, I didn't think I was going to bring you home this time. I thought it was over." Well, you see, he had went ahead and called my daughter and my grandchildren, and they had gotten there. He said, "The minute your eyes opened, he said you looked and you were crying." He said, I went over to you and I said, are you hurting? What's wrong? But all you could say was, no, did you smell those flowers? 
then he said he looked around. He said, there's no flowers in this room. And I think he honestly thought, and you'd have to talk to him, but I think he honestly thought that probably I'd been dead for too long. You see, I'd been dead. And he timed it. I hadn't breathed for 11 minutes. So for 11 minutes, which seems was eternity in heaven, 11 minutes, I was not there. I was somewhere else. But as I come to, and as I told that, and he, I, I began to speak to everybody. I, I couldn't remember a lot of things, but I knew where I had been. And I knew the urgency God had put on my life to tell people about heaven, to tell people what I've seen, and to try to tell them that they had to change their ways. You can't be on the fence with God. You can't have one one foot in the world and one foot believing in Him. You've either got to be off or on. God says it's important to give me your all. It's important to give me your whole mind, body, mind, soul, spirit. That's what we have to do if we're going to make heaven. As I was in the hospital for probably three weeks after that, everybody that come in, I I mean, I was talking to. Um, I called all my family, and um, a lot of them come to see me. A lot of friends come to see me. And the first thing was... How's your walk with God? Tell me about your walk with God. Do you know him? Do you know him as your personal savior? Not just somebody you listen to on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights. Do you know him as your personal savior seven days of the week, 24 hours a day? Now, are we perfect? No, we're human. Was I perfect? Oh, my goodness, no. I have failed him more times. But he has never left me once. I've walked away from him. I'm the one. I'm the one that has disappointed him. And I think about what we did to him, to Jesus, when we crucified him. And he did that for me, for you. He did that for us. And he asked so little of us. He took those stripes. And it hurts me to think of what we've done. And then I turn around and I disappoint him sometimes. How can I do that when I love him? You see, God... He's so merciful. He's so loving. (laughs) He'll take us back. Somebody had told me the other day, said, yeah, it's easy to walk away. Sometimes it's hard to come back. And I said, but it only takes, please, Jesus. The story of the prodigal son. That's right. That's right. Now, God told you you would begin to see angels. Yeah. And uh, there was a story about uh, just before an altar call that you saw one in particular. Could you tell us that story? I do. It was, see, I, I, like, like I said, I told everybody what I've seen. In fact, uh, people in the grocery store, I got to notice them kind of try to get away from me. And I even stopped the mailman <laughs> on the road. Because, I mean, I've, God had put this in my heart, and I, now I have this burning desire. So that was in September of 2019 when that happened. So come Christmas of that year, my local paper here, Ozark County Times, let me put a plug in for them, who are super Christian people, um, they called and wanted to do a story on it. And I said, they said, Charlotte, it's Christmas, and it's kind of a feel-good story. And I said, sure, that would be fine. So they did the story. Well, the day after they did the story, which was so funny because the lady called me from the newspaper, and she said, oh, Charlotte, I have to tell you that you have broke our server twice. Well, see, I'm not very computer. I, I mean, I'm a country girl, so I'm not computer literate or anything else. And I looked at my husband and I said, we are in so much trouble. I said, we have <laughs> broke their server. And I, I, I said, I don't, I, I guess we have to have it fixed, Danny. I don't know what that costs, you know. And, and she laughed and she said, no, Charlotte, you've had 11 million shares. Well, I can't even compute that. I mean, I'm just Charlotte. I'm nobody. But God's word is precious. So, they called me then from a local church here and asked if I would do a women's meeting that they were having on a Saturday. Well, I said, sure, you know. I mean, God did tell me to go, right? And I promised him I would go where he sent me. I would do what he told me to do. So you don't back off from God, or you better not anyway. So I said, sure, I will. Well, of course, uh, I'm a woman, and, and women stew about things, you know. Oh, my. I, I was just stewing, and I was worried. And Danny says, what are you worried about? And I said, I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about God. I want to, I want to, do, I want to make God proud. I want to do what he wants me to do. 
So Danny had built me a prayer closet years ago, which is where I'm at now. And um, I was in there on a Friday night, and I'm reading the Bible, and I'm praying, and I'm, I'm stewing, and I'm worried. And again, God had said, you will begin to see angels. You will begin to speak to angels. All of a sudden, I heard a voice said, what are you worried about? Well, I thought Danny had come in the room, and I hadn't heard him. And I looked up, and there stood an angel. And I said, what? And this angel said, what are you worried about? And I said, I'm worried because I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about my father. And this angel said, did he not call you? And I said, yes. He said, does he not go before you? And I said, yes. You know, from that day forward, I have never worried. I have never stewed. I just go with the knowledge. After I pray about something, that God is going before me, he'll make the way. I do see angels everywhere. I do get to speak to angels. I am blessed beyond measure. I wish everybody that is a believer could see angels. And I've talked to several that have. I talked to several that have seen angels or continue to see angels. You know, it's it's amazing to me the people that have the near death experience, the people that have seen angels, the people that doesn't and they don't tell their testimony. I can't I say why? Why do you not tell when they call me? Cuz we've gotten ca- thousands of calls from all over the United States and Japan. Believe it or not, I got one from Japan not too long ago. So I these people won't tell because I'll, I'll say, why do you not share? And they said, because people will think I'm crazy. Well, I guess I'm crazy. But I stand on what God showed me. I stand on what God told me. I don't back off from that. I don't care what people think. I don't have to answer to nobody but my father. When my time, when I'm up there for, for good, when he takes me home this time, he's already told me, when I take you home this time, it will be for good. But he continues to come to me, continues to lead me. He continues to show me things. He continues to let me prophesy, which I never believed I could do. In fact, I've heard prophets and think, "Mm, I doubt that. Don't doubt it. There are false prophets, I agree. But don't doubt. Don't don't put anything past it. It says, it says in Luke, for nothing spoken of God is impossible. Nothing. And it says in Matthew, with God, all things are possible. Oh, I mean, he's just laid it out, and he's given us the authority to work in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ. I have gone to several places. I've been blessed beyond measure, Danny and I have, of being able to go speak, whether it's to one person, whether it's to six, whether it's to hundreds. It doesn't matter. The one thing I love is God had told me, to always give people a chance to come to know him. My altar calls, the altar calls are never the same because God knows who's going to be there. He knows who needs what. And I've been so privileged, so privileged by the grace of God to see God do miracle after miracle after miracle. I've seen people that can't walk, walk. I've seen people that's paralyzed from the neck raise their hands and praise God. We've actually seen people that haven't been able to have children have children. Is it because of me? Absolutely not. It's because of their faith and because of our Heavenly Father. Now, like I said, our Father has a, he has a sense of humor. There's been many times I've prayed for people, and God says, tell them. And he'll give me something to tell them, and I'm like, uh, nope. Nope, no, God, I'm not going to tell him that. Mm -mm. And he says, I said, we must be, we must, must do what the Heavenly Father says. Because he does things in love. Through me, it might not be love, but through him, it is love. He gives me a word sometimes to tell people. Or he shows me insight, and they'll say, how did you know that? I don't know. Again, I'm a nobody. I'm just Charlotte, but I am a daughter of a king. Charlotte, let me ask you a theological question. 
Um, God is all loving, and many people um, cannot understand how an all loving God could have a place like hell or see people suffer like that. Um, what is this a hell that we uh, create for ourselves? I mean, how does how much does God participate in that in that uh, judgment? God has given us free will. If you have to make somebody, I mean, he can do anything. He can, and and I have no doubt. But you use your own free will. If you love somebody, you love them of your own free will. You don't love them because they've made you love them. He gives us that free will to make a decision. He wants us to come to him. He wants to show us mercy. It's our everyday life. Like I, I, I've seen people that I've hit, that that we've prayed for, and their healing may not be here on earth. I prayed for a, a gentleman the other day. It's been oh, several months ago. I got a call from a, a lady that wanted me to come and pray with her father. I've come to I had come to know her father, brother David. He was a preacher that I loved dearly. I mean, I love this man. He was a man of God. He had lost his wife several years ago, but he was a man of God. He was in his 80s, and I just, I cherished talking to him. I would call him. He would call me. And just the the joy that he put, he loved God so much. And we had been in several services together. I got it after he had had COVID. Me and him had talked, and he'd been sick through COVID. I got a call from his daughter, and they said he's, we found out he's in stage four cancer, Charlotte, and he'd really like for you to come and pray with him. I said, of course, of course. So Danny and I left. We went there, and I, I, I had an uneasy feeling the whole time. Something just, it, I just didn't feel right. But when we got there, I knew his kids, me and, and me and his friends wanted him to be healed. So I had that uneasy feeling. So I went to the bedside. And he had cancer of the stomach. And I laid hands on his, on his stomach, and we began to pray. All of us standing around him began to pray. And God stopped me dead. And he said, I will heal him upon your request. That didn't mean my request. That meant the request of his family. He would heal him upon his request, our request. I knew they wanted him to be healed. Like, we don't want to let our go. But you see, we have a free will. But he said he wants to come home. So I, I kind of fluffed that off, and I, I began to pray again over him. And again, God stopped me. I will heal him upon your request. He wants to come home. So I went, and I, I went into the other room. Well, his son followed me, his son and Danny. And they, he, his son said, what's going on, Charlotte? He said, I can tell you're troubled. And I told him what God had told me. And he said, I knew, I knew you, something was happening. You see, I seen angels gathered all around David's bed. I knew Brother David had them all over around him. He was a man of God. I walked back in there and I said, Brother David, I said, you've got angels standing all around you. And he shook his head. He smiled. And I said, God's saying he'll heal you upon our request, but that you're ready to go home. Brother David, do you want to be healed or do you want to go home? And he looked me in the eye and he said, I want to go home. I prayed that prayer with him and his family, that God would make his passing simple, that he would give him peace, because you see sometimes that's our healing. That taking someone home is their healing. So when we question God, why do you do what you do, God? He says, I know all. I know what is best for this person. Do bad things happen? Yes. Is he, and people want to blame God. Well, God, you took my son. I mean, I've heard that a hundred times. Why did you come back from heaven when my son didn't get to come back from heaven? I can't answer that. I don't know why. I don't know. And yes, it hurts. I've seen family members die. I've been around families that's lost family. But if they're a believer and if they're a Christian, and there goes the, the urgency 
to be able to talk to your family, your loved ones, and say, are you ready? Because once they leave this earth, that's the last chance they ever have. There's not a second chance. Hell is there, not because God wanted it, because that demon, his angel, Satan, caused that. Not him. So we have that choice. I mean, Satan makes this life look pretty good. We can party, have a good time, really enjoy it. But eternity is forever. You're either going to be in hell or you're going to be in heaven, and the choice is ours. That's our choice to make. After I prayed for Brother David, we left. And before I even got out of his drive, they called and said, he's home. He'd already went home because we were faithful to what God wanted. We were faithful to what Brother David wanted. Took him as easy as he could take him. I've seen people suffer, dying. I don't know why. I don't know why a lot of things. That's a question that you have to wrestle with with your own self. Is there something? Is there something within me? Is there something within me that needs to give myself to God? Is there something in me that is holding back a blessing? None of us are perfect. We fail him. I fail him every day. Every day I have to ask for forgiveness. I wish I was. I wish I could be that person, but I'm telling you, I am. I am, he has brought me so far from where he took me to heaven. When he brought me back, to, I have this burning desire in my heart now. I don't care who you are, what you've done. I don't care. A sin is a sin. He doesn't look at the outside of it. He looks at the inside of it. So it's our choice. Our choice. If you're going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. And Earth seems to be the place that we uh, are, are uh, supposed to learn to practice love and to uh, treat treat one another the way we would treat Jesus if he were standing in front of us. Yeah. Well, Charlotte, uh, th- this has been an amazing conversation, and I thank you so much for it. Um, uh, Lilia, who you've talked to, had asked me to ask you, if you were going to uh, tell a family that is about to lose a loved one to COVID or maybe has lost a loved one to COVID, is there anything in particular you would you, you would suggest to them that you haven't already mentioned? COVID is a scary thing right now. I believe COVID has been put on us, not from God, but from Satan. I've seen people, uh, I just uh, uh, had a family member die of that not easy. COVID happens. Good things happen. Bad things happen to good people. This man was a Christian. When he left this earth, he left this earth and went straight to heaven. The angels took him straight up to heaven. I talked to his son, and he said, when we were there before he died, we were surrounded by him and said he had had this COVID. He'd been in the hospital on a on a vent for a long time. It said his blood pressure was low, his respirator. It was said he, we knew he was going. And he said, I took a recording on my phone of his great-granddaughter, my granddaughter, singing to him. And said immediately his stats come up. So the doctor was standing there, and they said, we can't believe that. That music brought his stats up. Listening to that grandchild sing brought his stats up. And they, they had a little bit of hope. But you see, God had a bigger plan. God was going to take him out of his misery. God was going to take him out of the pain that he had been in. God was going to heal him. And they said they surround his bed and they begin to pray. And as they begin to pray, that he just drifted off. He said, Charlotte, I could feel the presence of our Savior around us. We could feel the presence of God as they took his, the angels took him home. He said, that is called peace with the dying. I have to tell you one story that 
has always struck with me. This lady come to me. She'd had twin boys. Twin boys were 23 years old, and they thought that they could do no wrong. They'd been to a party. She told me, she said, Charlotte, I raised my kids in church. I raised them to know the Lord. But 23-year-old boys thought they could do anything. They'd been at a party. They were drinking. One of her sons got in a truck and started home. He ran off the road, hit a tree. The truck caught on fire, and he burned up. She said, I was, I've been so devastated. I can't eat. I can't sleep. She said, just knowing. I kept thinking, God, is there any way, God, any way that he could have made it? Because according to your scripture, according to your word, he went out as, he went out as a sinner when he died. She said, Charlie, I took his ashes to church with me. Nobody knew it every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. And I prayed, God, there's be a way. She said, I had a preacher come to me. We were at church, and we were having a a revival, and this evangelist come in. I didn't know him. She said, that night after he got done, he come to me, and he said, ma'am, you don't know me. But I have to tell you what God sent me to tell you. She said, I turned and looked at him, and he said, he wanted me to tell you that your son, before he died, called out my name. And he is now in heaven with me. Whoa. For a mother. For a mother, there's nothing better than knowing that your child's in heaven. That is what a merciful God can do. So even to the very end, uh, God is willing to forgive. If only we can turn to him. Turn our face to his face. Yes. Yes. That's pure love. <laughs> that is. That is. Do they tell you anything about the person they're guarding? In other words, can you learn about this the person in front of you from their own guardian angel? No, no. I, I've never, I, I, I never hear him speak, speak but I, I can see him. I can see him. I, I and it's amazing because, uh, again, I, I, there's so much to there's so much I could tell you, and God is changing things so fast with me. It's it's um, I, I sometimes I question him, but Lord, are you sure? And he'll say I make no mistakes. So, but for instance, I there is a gentleman I know that is kind of heavy set, and well, he's a he's a believer. Well, God, his guardian angel looks a lot like him walks like him, if that's possible. And um, it's funny. I mean, they're there from the day you were born till the day you died. Your guardian angel is with you. Uh, you know, and so, somebody told me, said, you know, your guardian angel goes with you wherever you go. And I'm thinking, he does. And then and then I, I, I felt the presence say, even when you take them to the places that you shouldn't be yourself, they go in there with you. Now think about going to a bar or other places, and that guardian angel that God has assigned to you is right there with you. They are all kinds. They're all shapes. They're all wonderful. Um, It's amazing. I've seen the angels come in at church when I'm at church, and I've seen the angels just dancing. I mean, they they are rejoicing. They're dancing to this music song because the music ushers in the spirit before the word comes. Oh, wonderful. Be in a service where the angels are rejoicing, the people are rejoicing, and <laughs> your angel is rejoicing there with you. It's a sight to behold. Before this COVID, first COVID hit, I told Danny, I said, Danny, something's getting ready to happen. He said, why do you know that? I said, I, I look outside and I can see the angels just, it's like they're in a turmoil. They're just, they're, they're everywhere. They're just like they're, it's unsettledness. And right after that's when the COVID hit. God's been dealing with me lately on some stuff that I'm excited about. He says, he's been calling me about a revival coming. He calls it a healing revival. And I said, a healing revival? Like, you know, I think small. 
we think narrow-mindedness, like it's going to happen at my church, it's going to happen here, it's going to happen like this, like I think. And God says, you think too small. His thinking is on a large basis. But he's been dealing with me on a healing revival. He says, I'm changing your ministry. And I said, but no, 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 God, you, you, you give me my ministry already. He said, I'm changing your, your ministry. Well, that I still don't understand. I still can't wrap my head around that. But he says, it's going to be a healing revival. And it's not just for healing of the body. It's for the body, the mind, the soul, and the spirit. And I see this happening everywhere. I see this. I see what's happening in my area. He's not brought everything to light yet, but he will in his time. I'm an impatient person. When God speaks something, I'm like, okay, let's do it. Let's do it right now, God. Let's go. (laughs) And God says, in my time, sister, in my time. So I'm waiting because there's a healing revival coming, and it's not just here in Ozark County where I live. It's going to be throughout the world. Our world's in a turmoil. Yes, it is. What sign should we be looking for in that case? How is this going to come about? Not yet. Not yet. I I can't. uh... There's going to be tent revivals, a lot of tent revivals. I'm going to tell you that. Ah. And it's, uh... oh, man. Hmm. I'm so excited I'm beside myself. (laughs) (laughs) It's coming. It's coming. Just watch. Watch for the Spirit. The Spirit, if you pray about it, the Spirit will direct you. Watch. Some of you that's listening right now may be part of this healing revival that's coming because I believe it's going to be a 24-7 deal. I believe, and God keeps telling me, you you shall go to the trenches. You shall go to the trenches. (laughs) And I'm like, Lord, I don't think I'm made for the trenches. He said, I shall prepare you for the trenches. I don't know what that means yet. But I know it's coming. Well, on that happy note, <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll have to say that uh, that uh, we've reached the end of our time. Although, if you've got anything else to add, I, I, I'm open to hear it. I'm here. I love praying with people. That's probably my favorite thing in the whole world is praying for people. I love seeing people rededicate their life, born again, healed. There's so much to this that I, I and that my my family laughs because I give my phone number to everybody, and I get phone calls all through the night. But that's what the Lord called me to do. And if I don't honor that, then I have forsaken what he has asked me to do. I'm always here if anybody has questions or needs a prayer. So if you're uh, willing to put up with it, uh, how can people get in touch with you? I will give um, my phone number. You have my phone number. Yes. Uh, if you, uh, if they want to get a hold of you, uh, you can pass them right along that way. So if people want to reach Charlotte, they can email me. Exactly. At uh, Lee Whitting at Gmail, and uh, I will I will forward them to Charlotte. Thank you so much, Charlotte Holmes. God bless you. And thank you, uh, God, for choosing her to be such a, a, a powerful witness to, uh, to your love. If listeners would like to hear this show again or any of our more than 400 archived NDE interviews, go to Talk Zone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button. Or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can listen and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And uh, be sure to like, follow, and share our new NDE Radio Facebook page and discover our Facebook group and links to our YouTube channel while you're there. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app with your desktop or mobile device. And go to ions.org to learn all about IONS 2021 Annual Conference, which begins on Zoom on September 1st. Lilia and I are participating in that. And listen next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. Thank you again, Charlotte. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. So I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.